Okay, I want to pursue that for a second, but what is it you think people who are Eurosceptic don't get about a more federalist view of Europe? What is it that they are missing? Well, not all of them are missing it, uh, uh, but uh, I find them, uh, tip those are typically relatively close-minded people who do not have experience, knowledge, or uh, just the ability to uh, uh, understand the benefits uh, the existence of the European Union provides for, for uh, an average European citizen. You know, um, it's lack of education, uh, I would say, uh, in economics, which I mm -hmm. think is a, in general in this society that's a, a, a huge uh, stone that, uh, that we are pushing uphill, and that, that is the, not the lack of existence of education during the past 50 years but uh, the lack of, uh, of quality education and the lack of uh, bre the breadth of disciplines that people in a free world can freely study and get exposure to. We haven't had that, and I think that uh, uh, the, the, the relatively low understanding of, of basic economic, economic concepts within the Czech society is a burden that, uh, that uh, needs to be overcome. That was a long answer to okay. it. No, 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 no. <laughs> But it opens the door to a larger question uh, in, in my thinking. Um, go ahead. Maybe, I, maybe I'll go back. The, the, um, the Czechs, if Karl Schwarzenberg, who tells, tells me this anecdote is right, the Czechs invented National Socialism. So they have, uh, before that, before uh, National so Socialism was invented, Socialism was by definition international, so uh, uh, the Czech society does have the ability to to be uh, if if the Czech society ha does have the ability to be national and socialist at the same time, they have as they are, are showing us they have the ability to be eurosceptic and uh, and uh, uh, in many ways an eager participant <laughs> in the at the table of the European Union. So um, you know it's a it's the the. It's very new. It's very. Um, uh, uh, it's difficult for people who remember their country going through uh, all kinds of uh, uh, historical events uh, that they did not have much uh, influence over. Uh, it's difficult for people in that country to swallow the the uh, uh, degradation of what they see uh, uh, of their national uh, sovereignty. So I understand. Uh, uh, I understand the emotions that relate to it, but I think uh, those are issues that should be looked at without emotions. Well, and, and I, I want to go back to my comment about you opening the door to a much larger question, because uh, Thomas Friedman uh, uh, in the New York Times uh, frequently talks about, and he talked about it in one of his books, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, that the globalization is something that uh, we understand on paper. We understand the benefits of it, but the economic benefits of it. But what we are struggling with are the cultural consequences of globalization. And along that line, I mean, I would like to get your view on this uh, paradox, if you will, of uh, globally integrated markets and national democracies. I mean, what, what is your view on that? I mean, is this sustainable? Is it, what? what? Well, I think that the, uns the unsustainable thing is, uh, is uh, the European situation where national, there are national democracies with their own currency who happen to be a part of, uh, of a, uh, a larger entity and uh, uh, the, the, the fact that it simply has become, over the last few years, it has become clear that you cannot have a, um, uh, a union um, which is monetary, political, and many other things without it also at the same time being a fiscal union. That's, that is, uh, you know, that in this, in, I, I believe today is the single largest problem that faces uh, 
both the union as such and the international capital markets because all the other problems that we see in on the financial side in a way emanate from from this uh, single either lack of understanding or lack of ability uh, by union leaders to to craft an a an institution that will have all the uh, authority it needs to carry out its mission that hasn't happened <laughs> Let's stay on, the, on the, the political theme for a second, because I know you are uh, very outspoken about your political thoughts and, uh, and beliefs. And I just want to cover two points with you before we move on to uh, other areas of, of your life. But um, your financial support of political parties in the past and how you plan to deal with that going forward. D tell us a little bit about that. Um, I think that uh, um, the political system and Czech politicians, I hope there are not many politicians in the room, uh, are uh, uh, a major problem uh, for this country. Uh, the the results are historic, clearly, and we can argue whether, uh, sorry, the, the, the reasons are historic, and we can argue about which particular trait uh, of uh, uh, the Czech political class comes from uh, the, the communist era or was always around or, or not. You know, we can spend a lot of time talking about the past, but uh, um, the, the quality of uh, Czech politics has to improve. Politically speaking, the Czech Republic since 1990 is, is a, a total failure. Uh, in order to improve the quality, quality of the political institutions themselves, the people have to change. The people uh, who uh, run Czech political parties, the, the bureaucracy that runs government ministers, uh, has to change. And there are um, uh, legislative tools of, of doing it. For example, the, the, the long talked about uh, uh, law on public service is something that we will need. But I think that uh, um, uh, what's more important is to give Czech politicians the, to, the ability to act in a manner that, that is more consistent with the well-being of the country uh, than, than they are doing today by elevating the public discourse on topics of governance, uh, governing international policy, even sociology to some extent. Um, and uh, we are, I and my colleagues are now in the process of, uh, uh, among other things, setting up um, the uh, Prague branch of Aspen Institute, which over time, if we do it right and if, uh, if uh, we uh, manage to achieve the objectives we have set out, should become a platform for a high quality uh, dialogue for Central Europe, not only for Prague. We call it Aspen Prague, but the ambition is more Central European. And I hope that by uh, supporting uh, institutions and causes of this, of this uh, uh, type, I will be able to increase over time, ever so slightly, the quality of the public dialogue and that from that we can start looking for uh, well-meaning people who are able to engage in such a dialogue in a, in a rational and uh, intelligent manner and those then can become become uh, uh, hopefully more successful in Czech politics. Right now it's dominated by uh, people of the past. We have not, today I, we have I, nothing to I want to pick up the thread on the Aspen Institute in, in, in a moment, but first I want to go to uh, the, my second point about uh, politics uh, that I think that some people would find uh, your thoughts about it a little uh, bit of a counterintuitive approach to it. Uh, and that is uh, you and I have had a number of discussions about uh, corruption and, um, and one thing you've said in the past is, uh, look, before we can deal with it, we have to understand the roots of corruption. And your view of that is somewhat different than the view I've heard from other people. Share that uh, with us. Um, and I will 
then go back to your earlier question about uh, financing the political parties. But uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, most of us, and it's not only with respect to corruption, it, it's re with respect to many other national traits, most of us have gotten used to simply saying, oh, you know, between 1948 and 1990, we have had to learn such and such a survival skill because the Russians were all over us and, and we weren't free. I, uh, I believe that in terms of corruption, that, is, that, that excuse doesn't, simply doesn't work. Evidence is there that corruption was, was uh, prominent in this society. Before the war, uh, before the first war, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem which has to be understood for what it is. It's not a temporary imposed, uh, you know, from Asia imported, uh, uh, bad habit that we will be able to lick over a few years. And um, uh, what it com it's compounded by what I called lack of education. If you look today at the Czech pol uh, a business, business class, uh, the, to a large extent, uh, the, the people who uh, uh, make high-level decisions in Czech companies are people who did not have the benefit that many of you and I have had of being able to attend uh, a good school, learn ma management and financial skills, and then apply them at work. There are people who, by definition, have been self-taught. And uh, 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 this class of Czech businessmen uh, naturally has a, 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 a lower threat of of uh, acceptance for when it comes to corruption because they feel that's how things have always been done and that's uh, and you can do business without it so so the, the the natural question then is so what do we do i mean we all talk about the and it's it's not just here it's 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 becoming a uh, a global virus if you will and and we're seeing some of that play out in the arab spring but uh, do you see anything that is idiosyncratic to the Czech Republic when it comes to the topic of corruption? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Now, so what's the answer to it? I mean, do we attack this on a much more macro scale? Or, I mean, how do we approach this? There will never be a war on, a well thought out war on corruption that would would be uh, uh, funded by the state and you executed by, by somebody. It, so. that, that will never happen. We just have to have, uh, we have to make sure that over time we uh, have more robust rules, that the legislative process is, uh, is uh, um, uh, aware of problems uh, in current and future legislation that could, that could cause corruption. And we have to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we are not the only one of the six countries in the world that still allows uh, uh, anonymous uh, ownership of companies and stuff like that. It's simple okay. stuff. Uh, so the rules have to be fixed up. Somehow we need to, we need uh, uh, open-minded, uh, um, uh, forward-looking politicians who will get it done. I don't see them right now in the political scene. Uh, secondly, we have to uh, educate ourselves, as I said, and that's where the Aspen Institutes of this world, um, uh, the uh, uh, Transparency Institute that we are setting up uh, as part of our nonprofit uh, activities, which will specifically design anti-corruption programs, and it will specifically attempt to provide certain serv services in the, in the communication area that have been marked by corruption in the past, such as polling um, and things like that. So the rules have to be better, and we have to start, start a process of, uh, of elevating the level of the, the quality of the dialogue we have here in the Czech Republic, and ultimately uh, providing the education for people to be able to conduct their business and government's business with less, uh, um, uh, less corrupt involvement. I want to pick up the, uh, the thread of uh, philanthropy because I think this is a, uh, an appropriate segue to that. And I think it's a fair statement uh, to say that uh, uh, you are uh, misunderstood by a number of people about uh, some of your intentions. Uh, uh, 
full disclosure, uh, I'm on the board of uh, your foundation. I know that uh, you uh, currently are contributing uh, in the area of 150 million crowns a year to, uh, to efforts in the Czech Republic and that the Aspen Institute is now going to be your major new initiative. But before we get into some of the detail of that, share with our audience today the breadth and scope of your uh, philanthropic involvement. Oh. Uh, first of all, I, I turned 50 this year, and uh, 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 one day, many years ago, I decided that when I turn 50, I will start limiting my my work activities and uh, start doing things that I enjoy. So I have now worked very hard uh, um, at uh, achieving that. And I think to, to some extent I have. I have uh, essentially stepped away from executive involvement in, in uh, my company. I involve myself only on the capital commitment uh, at the capital commitment moment. And I spent at least 50% of, of my time giving money away, which happens to be much more difficult than, than making money. Uh, in uh, what way? Well, primarily because, less so in America, but outside of the States, there is such suspicion around, you know, charitable uh, giving about philanthropic activities because f such as, you know, in this society for the last 20 years, um, charity has been hijacked by by uh, um, people who see is it as a business. Is the suspicion the people who offer the charity, or is the suspicion from some other? The, 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 the suspicion is about the uh, intentions of the, of the donors. You know, in the UK, for example, it's not, not at all easy to become a donor of anything. It's, you can't just write a check and give it to somebody and they will be happy. That, you, know, you, have to, you have to find a way to demonstrate that uh, your intentions are as pure as, as the ones of the beneficiaries. So anyway, half of my time is, is today spent on, on various uh, philanthropic activities and non-profit activities. Uh, I include the cycling team in that, in that uh, <laughs> part of the portfolio. <laughs> um, and uh, what we do is uh, we focus, um, we have several entities and several areas of focus. Uh, our OKD Foundation is focused on, on Northern Moravia and uh, the social, essentially social uh, um, uh, causes that uh, need support over there. Um, the Zdenik Bakala Foundation, of which you are a board member, focuses on providing scholarships to Czech students who want to go to uh, study at top-level universities abroad. Um, the uh, Transparency Institute and the Aspen Institute will be focused on, on um, uh, A, the Czech Republic, ultimately Central Europe, uh, on uh, uh, leadership teaching leadership and educating f future leaders of this country. Uh, I support uh, several schools in the United States, uh, uh, primarily because I have some sort of a personal, uh, personal attachment to them. So the portfolio is, is relatively uh, varied. It's fast growing, I have to say. And um, uh, many of you probably know, unless he's here, Tomasz Kovania, who, who is uh, the head of all the nonprofit uh, non-profit activities that, uh, mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to uh, come back to the Aspen Institute because I don't know how many people in the audience understand what the Aspen Institute is and uh, how important it is and how it started. Tell us a little bit about that and tell us what your your hope is, who, who's going to be involved in it? Uh, I know you're having a, a launch uh, coming up next month. Tell us about it. Well, the Aspen Institute itself is uh, a, a, an American think tank, as much as I hate the word think tank, uh, which uh, uh, is just to, you know, to uh, give you a sense of how it differs from the Heritage Institutes and the Cato Institutes and the uh, uh, um, the American Enterprise Institutes and so on. It is a, 
it is an entity which was started out as a, uh, I believe, a society for the appreciation of ballet or something like that in Aspen, Colorado. So it comes out of artistic uh, emotions and uh, artistic objectives. It was not set up to become a, you know, conservative think tank supporting uh, a broad range of conservative policies in Washington. It has this. Uh, this uh, um, slightly different uh, origin. Uh, it has, as it has developed over the years, uh, it has developed a reputation of not being ideological, ideological, and not being partisan. So they never, you have uh, in the board on the board of Aspen US, you have Fred Malek, who is a, f a famous uh, Republican conservative uh, figure, and Madeleine Albright, who is exactly on the opposite of the spectrum, and they are they are be best friends. Unlike in the Czech Republic, where the Soviet tradition, uh, uh, Soviet tradition results in politicians constantly trying to, you know, uh, uh, eradicate the opposing party instead of working with the opposing party. Uh, here in in Aspen, we have two uh, political uh, opposites who are fully capable of putting their political uh, ideas and ideologies aside and uh, and work for Aspen. So, it's an it's a nonpartisan, clearly a nonpartisan uh, entity, and its objective through um, regular programs of seminars and, and so on, and irregular one-off events, its objective is to improve the governance, to educate future leaders, to provide leadership support, and to uh, uh, assist in providing the tools for uh, countries to improve their own governance and the understanding of its principles, which I think is stuff that, broadly speaking, we need in the Czech Republic today more than anything else. And, uh, and how does that supported. tie in with your comment to me that uh, you were naive? Remember your, your comment to yeah, me about I, I still think that I'm to some extent naive in uh, doing certain things in the hope they will, they will make an imp impact, which... Uh, uh, in spite of the fact that some of them may be the, the, either due to bad execution or yeah. other, other events will actually not have the impact I hope they would. But, uh, but what I get out of that, I mean, to sum up, is that the Aspen Institute is, is more interested in the pursuit of dialogue uh, than it is in the pursuit of ideology or yes, uh, absolutely. A, absolutely. A, a particular That's the guiding path. principle of Aspen. That's why... That's, that's one of the reasons why we decided it's an appropriate type of an institution to play a role in, in Central Europe.